So thanks so much again for the opportunity to present today. The work from the paper that I'll summarize today was largely completed during my PhD and also during my time as a postdoc at Columbia. So deep phenotyping, and I know there are many definitions of this, but this is the one we chose to use in the paper. So the precise and comprehensive analysis of phenotypic abnormalities in which the individual components of the phenotype are observed and described requires this very timely synthesis of multiple types of patient data. Common data models, as we all know and are very fond of, help solve many challenges of standardizing these different sorts of data, most prominently electronic health record data, but they are not currently able to semantically integrate all of the resources that are needed for the, the kind of deep phenotyping that we'd like to do. The Open Biological and Biomedical Ontology, or OBO Foundry, they provide ontologies that, that can create computable representations of biological knowledge that enables the integration of heterogeneous data. But mapping EHR data to OBO ontologies requires significant manual curation and domain expertise to do well. The goal of the work that we that is summarized in the paper was to develop a system that's capable of generating mappings between standard OMOP vocabularies and the OBO foundry ontologies. The figure on this slide is really meant to provide a high-level roadmap of the system that we developed, which we called OMOP to OBO. To be brief, the system obtains concepts and metadata from both OMOP and OBO foundry ontologies. It tries to obtain a mapping first by directly aligning concept codes and strings, and then leverages concept embeddings to match concepts using things like labels and synonyms. Finally, if a match is unable to be obtained from the prior approaches, it can process manually created mappings. And throughout the mapping process, the system tracks important metadata and collects evidence that it uses to categorize and output with the mappings. And the paper focused on leveraging this system to map a large subset of condition occurrence, drug exposure ingredient, and measurement results. So before diving into the results, I'll prevent, present some examples of what these mappings look like. So condition occurrence concepts were mapped to two ontologies, the human phenotype ontology and the Mondo disease ontology. And the example on the screen show one mapping from or to each of these ontologies. And note that these are meant to show when mappings go perfectly correct. So these are exact mappings, they're high confidence. And those were, were most often the kind of mappings we obtained for this domain. And they only get more complicated as we progress to the other domains. So drug exposure ingredient concepts were mapped to four ontologies. Chemicals were mapped to KEBI. Organisms were mapped to the NCBI taxon. Proteins were mapped to the protein ontology. And vaccines were mapped to the vaccine ontology. OMOP concepts were mapped to completeness across only those ontologies that made sense. So it wasn't the goal to map everything to each of these ontologies, but to create the best mapping that best represented the OMOP concept. And I show three different versions of a mapping within this domain on the slide where the topomeric concept was the, oops, sorry, was the most simple and straightforward mapping compared to a desglucan, which required three ontology concepts. And in this case, it's a human antineoplastic agent that involves the protein interleukin-2. Finally, for measurement concepts, which is by far the most complex of all to map, they were mapped by interpreting the results attached to that concept against a reference range where the result was aligned to the human phenotype ontology and the constituent parts of that concept were then, just like the drug exposure ingredients, mapped to several ontologies to best represent that concept. And two examples are shown on this slide. The first demonstrates what a positive and negative result for a urine test for amphetamines would look like. Here we use logic on the human phenotype ontology concept to indicate whether the result was positive or negative, meaning not that concept. And the second example shows what a mapping to a result, a result that is either higher, lower, or within a reference range would look like. So same kind of concept, leveraging logic to say when something was not an abnormal finding. So we evaluated the resulting mappings in, in oops, sorry, skipping slides around here. So with these mappings in mind and our goal to really create a robust set of mappings, we sought out then to use the OMOP to OBO, to, to apply OMOP to OBO to all standard concepts that had been used at least one time in clinical practice at a Colorado hospital. And we mapped them to the OBO ontologies that we discussed in the prior slides. 
So the phenotype ontology, the Mondo disease ontology, KEBI, the cell ontology, Uberon for anatomy, and the NCBI taxon for organisms and the vaccine ontology. And using this system, we built mappings for over 92,000 condition concepts, 8,600 drug ingredients, over 10,000 measurement results, to OBO ontology concepts that represented over 9,000 diseases, over 6,000 phenotypes, 83 anatomical entities, 2,700 organisms, 4,200 chemicals, 132 vaccines, and 272 proteins. So a really robust set of mappings between the OMOP concepts to these OBO foundry ontologies. And we evaluated the resulting mappings in three ways. So the first was on accuracy. We were fortunate enough to work with 10 domain experts who manually reviewed 20% of the most challenging mappings that we created. And from that, we found that 73.9% of our conditions, 70.7% of our drug ingredient, and almost 93% of our measurement mappings were found to be accurate. So when we say most challenging manual mappings, we mean when the algorithm wasn't able to find a high confident exact mapping, we were left to then manually map them, and those were the ones we chose to have reviewed. The next evaluation we performed was on generalizability. So we took the OMAP mapping concept set, and we said, how many of these concepts that we've mapped meaning how useful would this mapping set be if you were to take it and leverage it today? By looking at 24 independent hospitals that were participating in the Odyssey Concept Prevalence Study, and we wanted to see how many of the concepts we've mapped occur within that study. And so this was our measure of coverage, and we found that 99.5% of conditions, almost 100% of drug ingredients, and 68% of measurement results occurred in that set, meaning there was good coverage that if you were to take these mappings, there is a high likelihood they would contain all the concepts you were interested in. And it's important to note that the 68% of measurement results, which may initially sound low, is actually what you would expect in terms of similar studies that have been done in the literature. And the things that we were missing from the concept prevalence study were really concepts that occurred in low frequency. So things that were very rare, and we found we were able to work with experts to find concepts that we did map that would be similar enough that it could work within a different study. Our final evaluation was to look at the clinical utility of the mapping. So we compared the OMOP to OBO mappings to validated manual mappings when used in a task to identify patients with rare disease, specifically rare genetic diseases, using the All of Us uh, research program data. And when we examined this task, we found that when evaluating the queries, that the OMOP to OBO mappings, when used to create these queries, were able to identify 99.3% of the patients that could be found with this validated manual mapping set, so this gold standard, but using fewer codes overall and one third the query time. So that was a positive finding for us that we could find the patients we were supposed to using fewer codes and less compute time. And so just to wrap it up, this work would really not have been possible without a ton of people with the, the main supporters and validators shown on this slide. And I would just like to thank you all today for the opportunity to talk about this work. Thanks so much.